for the third time at this topic that Paul addresses regarding biblical manhood and womanhood, primarily, though not exclusively, primarily in the church at Corinth, which would be radically different from the culture around, but it also spills out into the culture when, when believers who are gathered, think about it, we're, we're gathered here today as, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to leave in a little while and we will be the church scattered. You go to different places. Some of you, most of you will be in places that most of the rest of us will not be. And so we take the light of the gospel with us. And so he's talking about relationships in the church, but that spill over into the culture. And that's what we've been trying to look at uh, in two previous occasions. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16. Stand with me if you would and follow along in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we've got the text on the screen, but we really can't emphasize enough that we want you to have your own copy of the scripture. Think about it. There are many countries in the world where this book is banned. No access to it. And depending on what happens in California, who you, who you believe about what's going on with the latest referendum there, uh, they're intensifying the law that says that no one can talk to a person who has uh, sexual identity issues and try to help them if it's, a, if it's a person who is biologically male to try to help that person rediscover that and embrace his maleness and his heterosexual maleness. That's against the law in California. You can be fined or prisoned in California. And so some are, some are suggesting, don't know if it's true, that the latest intensification of this may mean that the Bible you hold in your hand or the Bible you left at home this morning uh, is a book that is dangerous because it says he made them male and female. He made a man for a woman and a woman for a man. And brothers and sisters, whether or not you like it, that is hate speech in Canada. It's becoming hate speech in California and no doubt other states will follow. You better hang on to this book while you got it. Use it. Let's read this passage. Follow along as I read. Now I commend you because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head since it is the same as if her head were shaven. But if a, for if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut off her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was taken from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. This is the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Cultures change. Mores change. The word of God does not, because its author, God, does not change. Thank you. Please be seated. This is a challenging passage. Because Paul does something here, and I've told you this before, he takes an argument that is anchored in biblical history, and he uses it to speak to cultural matters. And for us to know how then, how then do we live in 2018 in the light of what Paul said to the Corinthians in mid 
first century A.D. We've told you that the principle here, we'll put it up on the screen again, uh, is this, uh, that the head of every man is Christ. The word for man there is not the word anthropos, mankind generically. It's aner, it's, it, it, depending on context, is, is man or husband. Head of every man is Christ. And then he goes on to say that the head of a wife is her husband. Very interesting. Husband there is the same word, on there. But context speaks of, of the relationship there. The uh, word for wife, gune, parenthetically. We have doctors who practice gynecology. They are woman doctors. That's where you get the word from. The head of the wife is her husband. And then he goes on to say, that the head of Christ is God. And we've talked about that. That's just the principle. We're not going to go over that again today. just want you to see that graphic and get a, get a, a glimpse of what he's saying. But I want you to go over the, the outline again real quickly. We have looked at this statement of praise that, that he began, I praise you and, and that you remember the traditions that I've taught you. He goes on and lays down this principle of subordination, which we just showed you. He draws some conclusions based on a woman's subordination to the man, not her inferiority, her subordination. We know it's not inferiority because the head of Christ is God and Christ is not inferior to God. Then he talks about support for the principle of, of, of subordination. We'll look at that a little more today than, than hopefully dive into these other things. A, a, a caution concerning a wrong conclusion, a, an appeal to the sense of propriety, an appeal to the custom of the churches. So with that in mind, let's just look quickly at this number four, support for the principle of subordination. We looked at this last week, verses 7, 8, 9. We really did not focus on 10. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority overhead because of the angels. The angels are, are ministering servants. They, they minister to the saints. Angels are keenly aware in heaven of order. There was an angel who decided he would change the order. And he was thrown out immediately cast out of heaven for the third of the angelic host who apparently had decided that they were they were they were behind him they were supporting his bid to be God Lucifer Satan heaven is a place of order Father Son and Holy Spirit communing eternally angels worshiping departed saints who've gone on before us adoring no controversy in heaven. No scheming in heaven. Because God rules heaven with absolute, unmitigated sovereignty. Now, earth is not that way. God is sovereign over earth. But we also know that the, that the devil is called the God of this world. He, he manipulates. He influences. He controls. He, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And he will do that to every son of Adam, every daughter of Eve, who has not yet become a follower of Jesus Christ. He cannot touch followers of Jesus Christ. But contrary to a lot of uh, prophecy teachers, contrary to a lot of demonology teachers, the only influence the devil has over you and me is what we give him. Don't give the devil a foothold, Scripture says. Paul wants them to know that when you come to follow Christ, Going to be born again, that there's an orderliness to that. It's a, it's a very beautiful, winsome, powerful portrayal of the beauty of the gospel. For in the gospel, one co equal, co eternal, co essential with the Father, that is the Son, willingly comes to humble himself and submit himself to the cruel, painful death, shameful death on the cross to the glory of his Father and is raised to life and ascends back on high, seated at the right hand of the Father, the hand of authority where he holds forth heavenly session. He prays for you and me. The gospel is beautiful and powerful and transformational. And Paul says that if we've been transformed by the gospel, we need to demonstrate that in society, no matter where society's going. 
So that's what he's arguing for here. And he says that the angels look upon us. The angels minister to us. We should not give them reason to pause and go, oh, wait a minute. That's what gospel transformation looks like? Wait a minute. The darling of heaven shed his blood for this? And so Paul makes this argument, historically based. Woman was taken from man. Now arguing from the heavenly standpoint. And so he cites what we read, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. We looked last week at Genesis 2, 18 to 23, that it's not good for the man to be alone. And so we read through that passage as well. I won't read it again to you today, but, but you have it. And then he comes, as I said in Hebrews 1, 13 and 14, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. He said that to Jesus, not to the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? The fifth point, though, I want to get to today. There's a caution concerning a wrong conclusion. So you could read up to now and go, wow, Paul's quite the uh, chauvinist. He's quite the misogynist, the guy who, who, who hates, has, a, has an issue with women. No, he's not. He's quite the follower of Jesus Christ, being led by the Spirit to write things down for the church at Corinth that have application to the church at Owasso named Bethel in 2018. A caution. Don't draw wrong conclusions. I've told several of you in conversation we've had, there is there's what, what we would call rational thought, irrational thought, and then there is biblical thought. And you've, we've got to increasingly learn to think, as one fellow said, think Christianly or think biblically. If you do, you'll, you'll discover true ration and reason, by the way. What's the caution? Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. See, if you didn't know he was headed there, you'd think, okay, well, we're just kind of second class. Man's the glory of God. Woman's the glory of man. He hasn't diminished woman at all. We're not independent. I told you, I think, last week, when you read Ephesians 5, 22 and following, which talks about the role relationships in marriage, wives submit to your own husbands as unto the Lord. I think I told you that. I've told you before, I know. That when you read that, if you read the, the actual Greek, wives to your own husbands as to the Lord. What, what to our husbands? Well, you've got to back up and put the context. Ephesians 5, 18 and following. Stop being drunk with wine, but keep on being filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making merry in your heart to the Lord, being thankful to God in all things, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's, that's where the word is. It's not in Ephesians 5.22. It's put there in translations for context so it doesn't, doesn't just become nonsense, wives to your husbands. But the word submit in Ephesians 5.22 comes from the word submit in 5.21, submitting to one another. There's a mutual submission. And the best marriages you will see is where each spouse tries to outdo love and service and care toward the other. The best marriages on earth are like that. The problem is that too many of us men don't get that. We're not independent. For, verse 12, as woman was made from man... So man is now born of woman. All things are of God. Trace it back to its source, to its head. Remember, that's the word. Who is the source of all this? God. He made man. And in his infinite wisdom, he gave man woman. And in his infinite wisdom, he said, and here's how the earth will be propagated. All will come from woman. One came from man to set in motion God's genius biological plan. And so I submit to you that the LGBTQXYZ agenda that is, seems to be holding forth and, and making ground across this country is nothing less than an assault upon the creative prerogative of our sovereign God. By definition, they do not reproduce. They pray 
upon unsuspecting children. They've entered the arena in some places, to my utter amazement, of being adoptive parents. Parents. I don't, I don't watch a lot of this stuff, but I see, I see uh, advertisements. Modern family. Does that ring a bell? Modern family. Got two guys raising a child. It's insane at best. It is an assault upon God at worst. God's a, all things are from him. And so, so don't get the notion that there's somebody inferior here. In fact, Galatians 3.28 says, in Christ, that Christ brings the new order, the new recreated order. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, distinctions. Paul tell, tears down the middle wall, it says that Christ tears down the middle wall of partition in Ephesians 2, making one new humanity out of the two. There's neither slave nor... By the way, that's why I'm not a Syro-American. My uh, background, my grandfather, paternal grandfather, was born in Syria. I'm not a Syro-American, but I am an American. I'm a Christian who happens to be an American. And I have affinity and brotherhood and contact with anyone who follows Jesus Christ. We are brothers. We are sisters. And that supersedes any other relationship you want to point to. Neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He has not obliterated the gender distinctions. What he has said is you're all one. Most cultures that would have heard this when it was spoken, and by the way, many cultures today look upon women as little more than, than their, uh, their chattel, their pets, their... Uh, I'm, fasc I'm fascinated. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. I'm fascinated that people are in love with the Muslim culture when the Muslim culture treats women like dogs. It's only Christianity at its best expression that shows the beauty and the harmony and the symmetry of the sexes. So Paul says here, don't draw wrong conclusions. Fifth thing, he appeals to what he calls a sense of Propriety. Judge for yourselves, verse 13. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Now, this is talking about congregational worship. So the guys out there who have said women need to keep silent in the churches, that's what Paul says, don't read the whole corpus of Paul's writings. He anticipates women will pray in church. But he says when you do that, you do that with a demonstration that you recognize God's order in life and you don't try to take on a role that is not God's intention for you. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it's a disgrace to him? Now, understand the cultural context here, and, and, and it could be argued somewhat here today. I'm, I'm gonna have some concluding thoughts in a minute, so hang with me. But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. We talked about this last week. Women, that doesn't mean that your hair's got to hit certain length. It's, it's a symbol. Stay with me. It's symbol. But he's arguing for propriety. And so the question you ought to ask is, okay, how do I conduct myself in the household of God to be sure that it's beyond a shadow of a doubt, I recognize that I am, by God's grace, by creation, I am a woman. Originally taken from man and yet designed by God to bring forth boys and girls. And that I, that I don't demonstrate a discontentment with God's creative power as if to say, I want to be a man. I don't want to be a woman. I want to be a man. In fact, I want to be better than a man. I want to be Annie Oakley. Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Oh, you can't? Yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes. You remember the musical? You know? We recognize that God has something special for you by virtue of the sex he gave you, biological identification he gave you at birth. He says, recognize propriety here. Veils are not the answer. Hats are not the answer. 
Hair length is not necessarily the answer. It's a heart. It's a heart. Where older women teach younger women to be, to be content. To, to love their husbands. To support them. I saw some guys in seminary who were pretty, pretty good guys. Their wives undermined them and you, they sunk like a rock as soon as they launched from seminary. But honestly, about the only way I've been able to stay in the ministry for 40 plus years is I got a wife that supports me. I know that. I'm not stupid. People, people get frustrated with me and, and get put out with me and they think, well, poor Karen, though. Bless her heart. And, and so they, they kind of love everybody through it because they just see how wonderful she is to me. That's, that's, that's true. That's true. Propriety. Don't undermine the man that God's placed in your life. Build him up. Come alongside him. Support him. Guys, there's a whole different topic for you. And that is you better love her as Christ loved the church. There's, a, there's something called men's fraternity. That we, ought to, we ought to run through about every six months. That's, what, that's how long it is, though, isn't it? Six months. Every year. Every year we ought to run it through and say, mandatory, every guy in men's fraternity to be sure that we remember how God expects us to conduct ourselves toward women. Because I promise you this, you can write it down. You show me a woman who is married to a man who is going out of his way to bless her, to encourage her, to, to delight in her, to care for her, to lead her. I'll show you a woman who doesn't give a second thought about walking away from that. And I'll show you a woman who would never even ponder, gee, I wonder if it'd be better to be in a relationship with another woman. It doesn't even come up. Propriety. Finally. And I mean it. Finally. Verse 16. He makes this appeal. It's, it's a, he does this in a couple of other places, by the way. If you disagree with me, that's okay. God will straighten you out. And he says that in one place. If you have a different perspective, that's okay. God will teach you better. He can say that. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit to write. I, I can't say that. Listen to what he says here. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, he says, oh, I don't know. Remember what he's talking about here. He's talking about people coming into the church, probably temple prostitutes saved by grace through faith. They come in and you look at them and you know what they do for a living. I mean, you, you just by the way they carry themselves, by the way they conduct themselves. A good friend of ours, you would know him, in another country, his wife and a group of women found much success in reaching out to the prostitutes in their city, and the, the Lord began to save them. They had Bible studies. They would take them in. They would, get, would dress them up. They would try to get them jobs. And, and it was amazing to, to watch God do this. And then the men, the wives in the church began to come to the pastor's wife and say, do you realize what you're doing to our husbands? Bringing these women in here? To, what's she talking about? Because the women weren't doing anything to, to, to go after their husbands. And they recognized them for what they had been. That's what Paul's talking about here. So he says, the answer is to conduct yourself in the maleness that God gave you under Christ, the head of every man is Christ. Under Christ. If you're not under Christ today here, man, you're, you're sinning. You're sinning. If you're not consciously placing yourself under the authority of, and headship of Jesus Christ to say, Lord Jesus, teach me. Make me more like you. Help me to love my wife like you love the church. If you're not doing that, you're sinning. Wives also show that you belong to one man. If you're a widow, that God gave you a man who's taken him home to glory and you live in honor of him. Women, teach the younger women. Teach these young ladies. Folks, do you realize that our sons and our daughters, our grandsons and our granddaughters are going to grow up in a culture that says, ah, all that, that nonsense. You can be anything you want to be sexually. That's what they're living in. We better fight it with the gospel. It's the only way they make it out alive. Fight it with the gospel. Living the gospel. Speaking the gospel. Teaching the gospel. Paul says, you inclined to be contentious? There's not a plan B. There's no plan B. God doesn't say, now this is the way I want you to be unless the culture goes really haywire on you and then you need to adapt. No, you don't. No, you don't. 
I don't care. Somebody declares this thing illegal. It's, it's, it is true in many countries already. This is God's word. I go down for this. This is God's word. Try to take that away from us, you might as well try to take my life. Because without, without this book, there is no life. There's nothing. There, there is no such practice, nor do the churches of God. He said, he said the churches that, that I've established by God's help, you go from Corinth to the churches in Galatia, Corinth to Thessalonica, Corinth to Philippi. No matter what their culture is, Paul says, these principles obtain. And that's what I want you to close with. Well, what is it? What, what is it? It's dress, certainly dress modestly. Uh, dress to honor God. But it's more of a heart conduct. It's more of a heart attitude. Men don't flirt with women. Women don't flirt with men. Men don't talk down about their wives to other men or other women. Women don't talk down about their husbands to other men or women. We support the days are evil. We live qualitatively and quantitatively different. And the prayer, here's what you pray. Someone will ask you why. I want someone, I want someone to ask my wife, why? Why are you so happy? Because answer is, first of all, I've been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. There's <laughs> And the distant second to that is I have a husband who failingly, stumblingly, no doubt, tries to love me. Because the culture is not happy, folks. Have you picked up on that? The worst euphemism in the history of the world is the word gay. Gay people are miserable people because they are living in absolute contradiction of what their soul that will never die tells them that they're supposed to be, that they were made to be. We need to reach out and show a better way. Miserable marriages. We, Christians don't need to add to the miserable marriages. There are enough of those already. We need to step into the, to the gap and show what, what delighting in Christ together can produce in our delighting in one another. The more excellent way. First Corinthians 13, we're getting there soon. Paul wants us to recognize order in heaven, in the church, on earth, and then to attach our lives to that order. Where you will find, by the way, when you delight in God's will and way and word, he delights in you. Him who honors me, I will honor, he says. But he goes on to say, and he who despises me, think about it. You and I would think that it would be honor and dishonor. When we don't embrace God's way, when we think there's a better way, we despise him in his eyes. Him who honors me, I will honor. Him who despises me, I will esteem lightly. I will not take Seriously, guys, there's a verse, 1 Peter 3, 7, where the Lord says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. I told you before, I'm, I'm, in, I'm enrolled in, in Karen 101, almost 44 years. I thought a couple of years ago I was about to graduate to 102, and then I realized, no, I'm, I'm still in 101. All right. Dwell with your wives according to knowledge. Treat them with respect as weaker vessels and as joint heirs of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Want to hear a paraphrase of that? So God will not treat lightly your prayers. It's God's order. We need to know it, find it, live it, promote it, and lovingly tell people, if you, found, you think you found another way, I promise you it's not a better way. And there are many today who have found a way, many on the road, and the end of it is death, destruction, and damnation. God help us to walk the narrow path 
of his righteousness by grace through faith and then encourage others to join us on that way. There's a way that seems good to many, the end thereof is death, but there is a way to life and peace and joy and happiness now, but especially to come. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to bow before you in Jesus' name. And Lord, oh, we live in Sodom. We live in Sodom. And they want our children. They want our grandchildren. They want us to submit to the culture. God, we cannot. We must. Oh, help us, Lord. We must obey God rather than the prevailing winds of the culture. We must obey God. Give us the strength to do that. Give us the clarity to see it in your word. Give us the, the spiritual tenacity to live it and, and the ability to lovingly say to a culture that's gone mad, you are not right about this. There is a better way. There is a better way, a more excellent way. So I pray you'll bless the precious ladies in this congregation. Help them to embrace your calling in their lives. Embrace the, the men in this congregation. Dear God, put us on our knees and our faces before you and then raise us up to be the men, godly men, that you have said we, we must be if we're going to model Jesus Christ. We pray for our sons and daughters, our grandsons, our granddaughters, that, that they will not be sucked up by this wicked and perverse generation. That they will come to know Jesus Christ and delight in Him. and want to be conformed to Him, be more like Him, love Him, love you. And then out of that, love others as they need to be loved. But we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.